welcome to the latest Longevity Tonic, a series of, of events by the Longevity Forum in which we explore human life and longevity through the prism of art, history, philosophy and literature. Living longer is not just about good health and wealth, it's also important that as life expectancy increases, we take care of our mental well-being and also our spiritual growth. And in this evening's webinar, Father Michael Collins, a dear friend of the Longevity Forum, uh, which you've gotten to know over the past few months, and a renowned art historian and author, will take us on a visual journey through one of the most important Christian pilgrimage routes of the late Middle Ages, the Camino de Santiago, something that both uh, Jim and Trish here at the Forum have uh, completed at various stages. Well, this is our last uh, webinar for the summer season before Father Michael takes a well-deserved break. We will return in September with a trip to Rome, at least virtually for now, to explore another important pilgrimage route, the Via Francigena. And I'll hand over to Father Michael now as ever, and please do send through questions throughout the webinar. On behalf of the Longevity Forum, I wish you a good and a safe summer. Thank you, Daphina. When I was a little boy, I read a book by a travel writer called H.B. Morton, a traveler in Spain. And I was fascinated by his account of Spain many decades ago. I think he was probably writing in the 30s, 40s and 50s. Uh, but it was something fascinating that really it grasped my imagination. And just a few years ago, five or six years ago, I had the opportunity of walking part of the Camino uh, not like Jim and Trish, I just did the same part twice, the last 100 miles, which has become really popular over the last 20 years or so. People can't, most people I think, can't just walk the 800 miles of the Camino, but many people are taking it bit by bit. Some people go, in fact, I know two people who go every year for two to three weeks, and they walk maybe 100, 200, 300 miles and then they go very slowly through the vineyards to relax. And then I think that delays them for four or five days. And then they recover from that and they make up by a gallop. And I know there are people who cheat and go by taxi and by bus. Uh, there's no trains as far as I know, but uh, I've done that myself even on one occasion. I missed one of my, my, my stages, so I had to take the bus. But nevertheless, it's great fun. And the, the thing about the Camino is it's a as I say, it's more than a thousand years old, but people can uh, go on their own. A lot of people actually set off for Santiago. They don't know who they're going to meet. They've no idea. And that's really interesting because you'll bump into strangers. And I remember on one of my, I think my first visit, I, I came across a young couple from Brazil and I got chatting to them. And they said that the reason they were doing this was because they'd had two children. The first was about seven, and the other baby was, I think, about maybe less than two years, two years of age. And they had come to make a spiritual pilgrimage because they wanted to thank God for the gift of their child, their second child in particular, for some particular for some reason. And I thought it was fantastic because they traveled a long distance to come here. And there they were merrily and jollyly bumping their way along the road, so happy, so content, a little family growing up. And that's part of the image of what the Camino is about. Or you can go with friends, like I went with the Bells of St. Mary's group of elegant ladies from Dublin a few years ago. And we, we had a wonderful pilgrimage, wonderful time. It's all about friendship and making ties and learning new things and new experiences. So without further ado, let me show you just two or three places that I've chosen along this 800 mile uh, stretch of road. It's too much to do the whole lot in 40 minutes. So let's just satisfy ourselves with a few bird's eye shots. For some 1400 years, people have followed a road across the north of Spain. Their destination was the medieval town of Santiago de Compostela, the shrine of St. James in the Field of Stars, which was believed to house the tomb of St. James the Apostle a companion of Jesus Christ. There are a number of routes that people could take in order to come to Santiago de Compostela. Santiago is a World Heritage Centre, the capital of Galicia in northwestern Spain, to the left of our screen. At the heart of the town is the main square, the Plaza del Obradoio, 
dominated by the awe-inspiring cathedral which houses the tomb of St. James, Santiago in Spanish. It is a compact, lively and buzzing university city town with long arcades and narrow cobbled winding streets which are almost entirely pedestrianized. So people who leave in order to go to Santiago in the northwest of Spain would depart perhaps from Paris or from Vézelay or from Le Puy, from saint gilles du gard from Grand Seval or Toulouse. But there were about 12 more departure zones throughout Spain and the western coast of Portugal. So who was St. James and why is there a devotion to him in the northwest of Spain? According to the Gospels, James was a brother of John, both sons of a man called Zebedee. Tradition attests to the missionary activity of James the Apostle, one of the 12 companions of Christ, who is believed to have preached the gospel in Spain in the first century. Such a proposition is not impossible. A ship's journey would have brought people around the Mediterranean with ease. Archaeological evidence attests to robust trade carried out along the coasts of Europe, crossing rivers and continuing along roads which were laid out originally by the Romans. However, there are no archaeological traces of an early Christian community in the north of Spain in the first century. And the Acts of the Apostles, a contemporary first century chronicle of the early years of Christianity, states that James was beheaded by King Herod Agrippa in about the year 44 AD. Yet a number of traditions grew up. One claimed that a shepherd was guided by a star to the site of a tomb, which was identified as that of James. In an era before widespread images such as we have today through magazines, TV, the internet and so on, such relics were of infinite importance. The artworks that the pilgrims saw as they made their way along the road must have visually stunned them, for they could never have seen such riches in their own villages or towns. Soon pilgrims flocked from all over Galicia and beyond the north of Spain. As the shrine's fame spread, pilgrims came from ever, ever further reaches. While most pilgrims traveled for religious reasons, the shrine was also a focal point for the Christians who resented the dramatic spread of Muslim settlers from the eighth century onwards. By the 10th century, various routes had been established along which pilgrims traveled. As far as the pilgrims were concerned, Compostela, the field of stars, housed the human remains of the apostles. In the Middle Ages, religious orders and buildings were raised across Europe, busily competing for the best relics as a way of attracting the pilgrims. The relics of St. James would transform Santiago de Compostela to the equal of St. Peter's in Rome. Chartres Cathedral in France claimed the, to house the girdle of Mary. Orbiedo, the face towel which covered Jesus' face in the tomb and so forth. For some, a pilgrimage was an ecclesiastically approved way of seeing the world. Given the chance to undertake a, such a journey, Many gladly set out from villages and towns to cross new terrain, even to cross oceans. New vistas opened up before them and the opportunity to encounter new cultures, hear new music, learn new dances, speak new languages, try new foods and experience a rush to the senses. It certainly wasn't all penitential. Regularly pilgrims were given the task of making the holy journey to expiate sins or even satisfy transgressions of the law. Such enterprises were not without danger. Medieval manuscripts attest to the ever-present threat of illness and theft. 
it was not uncommon for pilgrims to be murdered, perhaps in lieu of a few pennies or paltry possessions. As the pilgrims made their way through the towns such as here in the university town of Salamanca, they admired the facades and the interiors of these magnificent churches. The pilgrim usually took little more than a staff a bowl to eat with, and a pouch for water. As they made their way along through the medieval towns and villages, they received hospitality from the monks and convents which had been set up along the route, which provided them with a basic place, a roof over their head for the night, and a simple meal to start the day. It's estimated that some half a million people passed along the route at the height of the medieval era. And as the pilgrims left a few pennies to light a candle or to pray in a church, these were collected by the city authorities and the ecclesiastical authorities who built wonderful churches and cathedrals, embellishing them and adorning them with magnificent works of medieval art. The church at Conk, which we view here, was one of the most important pilgrim points for those who traveled through France. To come before the extraordinary statue of Saint Foy, to admire the tympanum and the portico, to view the jewels which had been bequested over centuries, to admire this artwork and remember the people whom we are accompanying in our pilgrimage were certainly less sophisticated than today. They probably would never have seen gold and jewels in such abundance. And to look on the statues of the saints was almost to glimpse heaven itself. Vast cathedrals and abbeys must have overpowered the pilgrim who listened to sermons about vanity, about patience, about suffering, about overcoming challenges with fortitude. And the pilgrim was urged on day by day to continue to resist the slings of outrageous fortune, to avoid deception, and to live honorable lives. In Burgos Cathedral, where 40,000 people traveled a day in the high middle ages, people listened to homilies, sermons by the church authorities, but 
most of all, they looked at the wonderful art pieces and they tried to interpret them. And in this way, they shared and deepened their religious faith. For at the period in which we are discussing and following, there was an extraordinary explosion of art and architecture. Skills which were infused with the arrival of the Muslims in the 8th century. And so Spain became a melting point where Jews Christians and Muslims lived in relatively harmonious coexistence. Burgos Cathedral is a hymn in stone. And the journey across Europe must have been fascinating for the people. Again, we would be very foolish if we saw the pilgrimage to Santiago simply in terms of a penitential exercise. For there must have been tremendous fun, there must have been great enjoyment, there must have been challenges. There must have been great concerns indeed. But the highlight was to come when they arrived at the shrine of Santiago de Compostela. And perhaps as they then sat in the evenings discussing what they'd seen, the stories that they shared, the experiences which they had undergone throughout the course of the day, the week, the months. They must have been humanly enriched. The most important part of the arrival at St. James on the road to Santiago was to take part at the Pilgrims Mass. The highlight for the Pilgrims, therefore, is to attend this ceremony. Such is the demand for places that Pilgrims are asked to attend only once during their visit. At the end of Mass, some burly men come to the sanctuary Rejoicing the na name of Tiraboyeros, they unwrap the cords which hold the famous thurible suspended over the transept. The five cords are attached to enormous chain and pulley. Slowly the thurible is lowered to the floor of the sanctuary in front of the celebrants. The organ blasts out as the crowds stand to see what is about to happen. A man in a purple cape steps forward as the lid of the censer is lifted gingerly inserting a bowl of a dozen smouldering charcoals. The thurible then is hoisted into the air, plumes of blue-gray smoke swirling upwards, perfuming the air. The pulley allows the huge botofumero swing into action. Although incense is used in the religious ritual, the real reason for swinging the thurible above the crowds is to fumigate the air. For these people have walked hundreds of miles across varied terrain. Washing facilities were basic, most simple, simply washed in streams or rivers without the benefit of soap. The incense heightened not only the sense of excitement and spectacle, but covered a myriad of odors from the mingling crowds. So who was St. James the Greater, son of Zebedee? He was one of the 12 apostles, a missionary, companion of Jesus, a brother to St. John. He died in 44 AD, according to tradition, under a persecution ordered by King Herod Agrippa. His body then was discovered in the ninth century, and King Alfonso ordered a church to be built to house the relics. The bishop was Theodomir of Ilia, for a shepherd had come claiming that the relics of the saint had been discovered in this very area. According to one of the most colorful tales, the body of St. James was placed on a rudderless ship on its way to the Iberian Peninsula. The ship sailed up on its own, the river Ulla to modern day Padron, 
where the Queen of Lupia refused permission to bury the body. She sent her soldiers to chase away the foreigners, whereupon her soldiers were killed and the Queen converted to Christianity. The body, according to the tradition, was then loaded onto a cart and the ox was left to decide where to go. When the ox stopped in the area which is now called the Field of Stars, the body was buried. Theodomir then received funds from the king in order to build his church. St. James is venerated as the defender of the Christians of Spain, especially from invaders. One of his titles is St. James, the Slayer of the Moors. There was a spurious battle between a Christian and Moorish army in which St. James appeared to kill the Moors. This is called the Battle of Calvillo. It never took place. It was the stuff of legend. Muslim armies had entered Spain historically in 711 and Islamic rule spread across the peninsula. St. James was venerated under the dubious title Santiago Matamoros, St. James the Moor Slayer. The Islamic armies arrived from North, Northern Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar and their influence was predominantly felt in the southern part of Spain. And as I mentioned, Jews, Christians and Muslims lived in those early centuries in a harmonious coexistence. Islamic rule remained strong until 1492, when on the 2nd of January of that year, Abdallah Muhammad bin Ali, or Muhammad XII, known as Bobadil, the last Moorish Sultan of Granada and head of the Nasrid dynasty, surrendered his city and handed over the keys of the Alhambra, his castle, to the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabel. One of the important and popular places for beginning the tour was in Paris. And the tour is perhaps maybe a good name for the Camino today. Many people carry on a journey across the 800 kilometers from France uh, along the north of Spain. But one of the places to start was also to see France. The Tower of Saint Jacques was one of the most important departure points for pilgrims. The present hour is all that remains of a church which was built by the Butcher's Guild between 1509 and 1523 in the flamboyant Gothic style developed by the French. The church was demolished in 1793 during the French Revolution. Pilgrims changed into their pilgrim clothes, usually a brown cape and broad brimmed hat with a shell of St. James to identify them as pilgrims. This of course was important because it guaranteed them a certain autonomy and protection as they passed from town to town along the pilgrim route. Having recited prayers, they set off on the first day's journey. Most walked on foot, while mules or horses were available for groups or wealthier people and mules also were used to carry food and clothing. Everybody paid a penny or two in order to have the use of the mule for the day. The reasons for pilgrimage were varied. Some were devotional, others expiation of a sin or crime, 
a cure, a search for a cure, or simply curiosity. Society was feudal, meaning that vast numbers of people lived close to poverty, supporting a small aristocracy. One could argue that aristocracy supported the poor. Most lived on the land, and in today's terms, even the aristocracy and wealthy people lived relatively modestly. We should also remember that the vast majority of people who followed the Camino were men, because in feudal society and medieval society, a woman's place was in the home, and it was regarded as far too dangerous for a woman to undertake this journey. Pilgrims saw many wondrous sights on their journey. Here we come to the town of Conk to see the church of Saint Foy or Saint Faith in central France. Saint Foy, according to legend, was believed to have died during a persecution ordered by the Roman Emperor Diocletian in the late third century. Her body was buried in Aquitaine, but in the ninth century, it was stolen by a monk from Conk. In 866, a church was built on the pilgrimage route to Santiago, which was just beginning at that time as a pilgrimage sanctuary. Over the Abbey Church, there was a vast tympanum built over the main portico. It depicts the last judgment and reminds the faithful that at the end of their lives, they will face God's punishment as Christians. The vast polychrome sculpture enthralled the pilgrims, most of whom could never have seen such a work of art in stone. Jesus sits at the center, the judge, his right hand raised in judgment. For this is a forerunner of the last judgment painted by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel between 1534 and 1541. To the left, the just are led by angels to paradise. To the right, Jesus points to the damned, lowering his left hand in condemnation. The damned are led to hell and eternal punishment. Here, demons inflict tortures. A demon in the lower left corner pushes the condemned into the mouth of a monster. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus according to the Gospels, is hanged from a tree, a reminder to pilgrims of the value of fidelity to the Christian message. The picturesque demons inflict punishment on the souls of the damned, and here a dog-like devil pulls the hair of a startled sinner. Two demons hold a sinner strapped to a pole over the flames of eternal punishment. Think of the effect that this must have had on the pilgrims. Looking at this image, St. Paul to the left, St. Peter at the center, and Mary the Virgin to our right, flank Christ, Christ the judge. The bishop leads the king into the presence of Christ. The pilgrim's money contributed to the vast churches and cathedrals along the route. The golden statue of Saint Foy, Saint Foy, was covered by gems, diamonds, rubies, emerald, sapphires, amethyst, all offered by the wealthier pilgrims. Statues usually began as carved in wood and then were perhaps covered with sheets of gold and the jewels which encrusted them. The pilgrim was granted the protection of the civil authorities. It's estimated that in the high Middle Ages, 40,000 pilgrims passed through the city of Burgos alone. They crossed rivers, often paying a small coin for the facility of the bridge, or perhaps even to enter into a town. Each day the pilgrim walked several miles and at night they took refuge in the small hostels run by monks. These were free of charge and food was provided 
any medical needs would be attended to before the pilgrim set out the next day. Those who went on pilgrimage had to be free of death and were not allowed to have any civil law case against them pending. When they arrived at Santiago, they entered the cathedral church through the portico of St. James called the Portico of Glory, built in the 12th century by the master mason Matteo, who carved the portico on the orders of King Ferdinand of Lyon between 1168 and 1188. With 200 sculptures, it is the high point of Spanish Romanesque art. Originally polychrome, it was repainted successively until the 18th century. At the center, Christ is flanked by the four evangelists, angels and saints. Musicians here show us the instruments which were played during the Middle Ages. The statues of the prophets and kings of Israel invite the pilgrim at the end of their long journey. One of the greatest medieval manuscripts connected with Santiago de Compostela is the Historia Turpini, the Code of Calixtus, given its title by the Pope of the Era. The code, the document, the vellum manuscript contains prayers, legends of St. James, all of which enthralled the people as they listened and as they considered their return back home. And when they returned, they needed to bring their passports, which they had stamped, to show the civil authorities when they arrived back in their hometown that indeed they had continued the pilgrimage all the way through to the end. A modern tradition now has grown up where people continue to the very coast of the northwest of Spain to an area called Finisterre, coming from the Latin Finisterre, the end of the earth. And there are two traditions. One, you make your final prayer and wish for what you have prayed for at the Shrine of St. James. But also in the last number of years, people have taken to burning some of their belongings, perhaps their clothes which have been worn away or their boots during the course of this trek and then turn around to make their way home. Well, thank you, Father Michael. What a journey. Wow, that was very interesting. Thank you so much. Now we have a few questions. Uh, the first question, I'm very interested in hearing the answer. It's, were there any knights commissioned to protect the pilgrims to Santiago, like the Templars in the Holy Land? Uh, yes, there was an actual fact, an order set up in the 12th century in order to protect the pilgrims, because as I mentioned, it was a dangerous enterprise. Pilgrims were more or less unprotected. They travel unarmed. Uh, some of them carried a small amount of money, a few goods on their, on their person, very few would have carried things of any worth or value because this was a pilgrimage. So they, the Knights of St. James were established in the 12th century as a military order. And in actual fact, they're one of the four military orders which still exist to the present day, even though in the 19th century, they were decommissioned and uh, uh, disbanded, but nevertheless, they were uh, reconstituted again. So they, in a sense, have existed for the bones of 800 years. All right. Now a follow-up question from me is, what are the four military orders that still exist today? Oh, I can't tell you. <laughs> Pass. Is it, would the Swiss Guard count? No, 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 no. no. These are the Spanish orders. Uh, okay. um, I can't remember the, the other ones, but these, there was a, these ones were uh, for Santiago in particular, so they looked after uh, the pilgrims who are on the way to the Shrine of St. James. Okay, great. Now, are there any famous paintings depicting pilgrims on the Camino? And if so, where can they be found? Well, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't answer that there are any paintings of pilgrims who are actually walking along because 
I suppose artists weren't inspired by that, but there were very many famous people, for example, um, Angela Merkel, for example, I know she and her husband made the trip, Martin Sheehan, the actor who made a movie on the Camino. Um, let me think, Anthony Quinn, who was the film actor, he made the uh, journey on the Camino. Uh, I don't know if Theresa May has done the Camino, maybe she is too devoted to Wales, but there are many, many people. St. Francis of Assisi, for example, he certainly was in Spain uh, around 12, 15, 15 or 16, if I remember correctly, and he also walked part of the Camino. So yes, uh, there would have been a large number of well-known people, but the majority of them, keep in mind, these were just ordinary people. Uh, they weren't able to you know, cover everything and, and they just uh, made the journey for their own particular reasons. Interesting. And of course, you've done the Camino a few times, correct? Uh, only no, and I, I okay. cheated because I did the same portion twice and it was the last hundred miles into the city because uh, I would hope someday to start, let's say, at the, the Tour Saint-Jacques in Paris and maybe walk a little bit more. The French part is very interesting. And I love also the Via Francigena, which we'll be following in September when we come back after the vacation. And that's a fascinating place. But I would say... I, I, so many of my friends have undertaken to go on the Camino now because they're enthused about it. They love the whole concept of walking either on their own or in company, cycling, walking, taking uh, the hard way or the softer way. It's so interesting and so engaging. Do you have a favorite part of the Camino that you've done yourself? Yes, I do actually. I, the, the favorite part that my mind goes back to all the time is walking through a eucalyptus blade uh, when I was walking with my friends from Dublin, the pious and elegant ladies, the bells of St. Mary's, we were walking along, praying the rosary in actual fact, and um, then there was, during the silence, just the smell of the eucalyptus oil, in the, it was September, it was just heavenly, so it's nature was the part that grabbed me, although I think the most wonderful building I saw was not in Santiago, but in Burgos Cathedral, I, I included a few shots of the ceiling there, which are uh, absolutely magnificent works of art of intricacies uh, in, in the stonework. Great. Okay, now a couple questions back on the medieval period. Uh, any idea how many people did the pilgrimage every year in medieval well, times? Yeah, there's an estimate uh, between 400 and 500,000 people walked uh, across the Camino every year. But you see, there were a dozen routes there was probably five or six major routes, but there were also smaller routes coming from Portugal, for example, or southern Spain. So it would be quite difficult to add them all together. But certainly, I remember reading one time that uh, 40,000 people passed through Burgos every day during the high part of the season. So that's a lot of people going through, a lot of pilgrims. Now, and where would those pilgrims get the funds to complete this pilgrimage? Uh, well, you see, they relied on charity because the first and an important thing about the pilgrims was that they had to leave without debt. So they couldn't leave their homes if they had a debt. So that, that was one very important thing. And then they relied on, on charity. And that's why, you know, when you see these magnificent churches, as I say, they were built on the pennies of the poor. But at the same time, the monks and the religious orders set up hostels and hospitals. And in fact, in September, when we walk in the Via Francigena, I have two amazing places that I've selected to show you. So maybe I'll just keep that under cover until, until we meet again. Great. Thank you. And I have another question about what's the major difference, differences between the Camino and Via Francigena? Francigena, <laughs> my apologies. And can you give us a flavor of? Yes, exactly. Well, the, the Camino, as I mentioned to you, really um, traditionally started perhaps in Paris and went across the Pyrenees over to the north of Spain, the northwest of Spain. Whereas the Via Francigena went from Canterbury, the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket, the church of St. Augustine of Pippo, uh, of, excuse me, of the Canterbury, um, across the channel and then went down through France, where I guess the name, the Via Francigena, and across the Alps, down through Italy and on into Rome. And in actual fact, from there, you could add, add on a meritorious piece which would bring you to Jerusalem. 
so that was the kind of the overall medieval name for the the path that people people trod. But the Via Francigena is nothing as well known as the Camino. Let me say, at the moment, uh, there, in two thousand and eighteen, there were over three hundred and twenty four thousand official pilgrims who got their cards stamped, this famous passport. But I'd say there was probably double that, uh, triple that of people who, who never bothered getting the passport. I don't think that's really important. This year is going to be an important year because in every year when uh, the Feast of St. James on the 25th of July falls on a Sunday, it's referred to as a holy year. And people uh, would, would make a special pilgrimage during that time. Obviously, with COVID, uh, it's going to be reduced to a degree and the year continues on until uh, 2022. But again, in terms of longevity, what I was aiming to show was uh, people in those days, remember they lived to about 40, maximum 50, and yet they were willing to take out several months of their lives in order to, to take this journey on. So in a sense, we're, we're going back into a different mindset where people have different religious views. But if I could also say, I watched in German, on German television a couple of days ago, um, uh, a Spanish doctor who is making his 99th pilgrimage to Santiago, and he's an atheist. And he also had COVID, so he was getting himself into shape again, and he was walking along, and he just laughed. But that's the interesting thing. Uh, many, 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 many people uh, who walk the Camino, are they don't belong to any religious affiliation or any faith uh, set whatsoever. So. It's a it's a it's a journey for everybody, and it's a symbol, I think, of the journey of life. Oh, definitely! And what a great tale of longevity that is. Now we do have one question. Sorry to focus on earthly delights, but given we are talking about Spain, any favorite cultural and culinary experiences? Uh, well, I have to say I'm not a gourmand, so I wouldn't be very good at. Uh, maybe choosing, but I, I remember uh, being with the Spanish Tourist Board two years ago in Leon and Burgos, and we went to visit a vineyard, and I don't drink wine, uh, but the food that accompanied the wine was so enticing that I had a glass of wine, and it was a very happy experience, I can oh, tell you. But the cheese, the cheese is wonderful. The cheese is really magnificent, but uh, Spanish food, Spanish life is wonderful. I'm really looking forward to going back to Spain soon. Oh, good. And that leads us to our last question. Um, so summer has arrived and we are taking a short break from these longevity tonics, although the longevity forum never takes a holiday. Uh, we'll be back in September with the next webinar. So would you like to tell us a little bit about the next uh, webinar and your end of summer plans? Oh, well, of course, with COVID, uh, most of our plans are put on hold and we don't know what's going to happen from one week to the next. But nevertheless, uh, when we come back in September, I have a few more ideas. And indeed, if I could invite anybody who wants to put forward a suggestion for a webinar, I'll very gladly do the work. If you give me the, the idea. I'm very happy to do that because that's what I'm really content doing, researching all these various things. And I have a couple of ideas. Just even this afternoon, one idea came to my mind if we were to look at how artists depicted famous people who were supposed to have lived to ripe old ages, Rip Van Winkle, um, Abraham, and you know many, many others. That would be one I'd like to tackle. But the Via Fragigina is, is amazing because, as I say, it's not very well known, uh, either in the French part or in the Italian part, even though both governments have undertaken to try and expand tourism in the region over the last number of years but it had fallen into disrepair. But the wonderful thing I would say about both the Via Frangician and the, Via, the, the Camino of Compostela is that along the road, you just go to these wonderful villages, uh, churches, palaces, and call into them. And they're just glittering with fantastic treasures, hidden gems waiting to be discovered. Uh, and I remember, when I walked along the Via Frangicina and I came to a lovely little town called Vitrala, it was like walking into the 1950s onto a Hollywood set because it was really like something from an Anthony Quinn movie. Uh, time hadn't moved. The people even were dressed in an old fashioned way. And the men were there in their jeans and white t-shirts and black leather jackets, uh, smoldering away at the ladies who were passing by 
uh, on their way to and forward to the fruit shops. And I, I was just amused as I was sitting there taking a coffee, in fact, a few coffees, how often the ladies would go backwards and forwards to buy more purchases as the young men smoldered and flicked uh, a cigarette from their lips. Yeah. So <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. It's just, it's fantastic. Uh, all I could say is, look, these webinars, are, the whole purpose I do these is just to give you, uh, to whet your appetite. So you'll go off and do these things or go to the museums, go to the buildings, go to the palaces, go to the monuments and see them for yourselves. Well, thank you so much again, Father. We can't wait to hear more about these in September. And thank you again, everyone, for attending. And please stay tuned for our for more information on our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, Twitter, longevity underscore forum. Thank you. Mm -hmm.